first at four. The city of Detroit is expanding eligibility for the COVID vaccine. We'll tell you who's getting in line now. And here's Paula. Well, getting students back into the classroom safely is only part of the challenge. For educators, the next big frontier is dealing with the learning lag. Hi, Ben. Paula, we're in the middle of two beautiful ones. You're brightly backlit there, and we will see more sunshine tomorrow. We will not see any warmer temperatures at the end of this forecast, but we look at a huge polar plunge. All that right now, first at four. Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News First at 4 starts now. Good afternoon, I'm Karen Drew. First at 4, the battle over a heated push to let them play is now heading to court. The group called Let Them Play Michigan is among the plaintiffs that sued today to reinstate winter contact sports immediately. The complaint alleges the state health department's order violates the constitutional rights of high school student athletes. The pause on winter contact sports was recently extended through February 21st. Attorneys argue with other restrictions being loosened across the state, why not contact sports? We've got high school uh, physical education going on, right? We've got an hour long basketball game probably occurring right now uh, in a PE class somewhere in this state, but yet the student athletes at three o'clock can't play basketball. I don't really understand the data or science behind that. The Department of Health and Human Services released a statement this afternoon. It reads in part, quote, as to the particular lawsuit, the administration does not generally comment on litigation and does not make decisions based on lawsuits, but on data and on the ongoing advice of public health experts. We're also tracking other developments connected to the pandemic, including an update from Detroit's mayor on vaccines. First, the state of Michigan is reporting just over 1,200 new cases in the last 24 hours, and we've seen 63 additional deaths, including 36 from a review of records. Today, the state's top medical executive, Dr. Janae Khaldun, testified before Congress, saying 90% of the vaccines the state receives is administered within seven days. The city of Detroit has been one of the state's vaccine success stories, and it is expanding eligibility again. It's adding restaurant and grocery employees to the list, plus security guards and janitors living or working in Detroit. There is no place else where you can dial the phone. You typically get on in 10 or 15 minutes. You get your appointment. You drive in, uh, and you're usually out in 35 to 40 minutes. Uh, and so we're going to continue to expand this. Uh, to more and more Detroiters. As the mayor just pointed out, anyone getting a vaccine in Detroit must make an appointment. We did post plenty of vaccine information for people throughout Metro Detroit at clickondetroit.com. Oh, if there's something we've learned lately, got to enjoy any quiet sunny days when we get the chance. Ben Bailey standing by with the first forecast. That was a pretty shot behind Paula earlier in this newscast with that sun glowing. Definitely got your attention because we don't see it all that often uh, this time of year, especially this winter, Karen. It is bright out there right now. We're going to get the sunshine back tomorrow. Temperatures have managed to eke up just above freezing there at Detroit at 34, but still seeing some upper 20s and low 30s elsewhere across the region. Weather impacts as we go forward into the next couple days. Again, beautiful conditions tomorrow, very similar to what we had today. Thursday, we're going to be getting some rain and then snow. Friday, some snow showers and windy conditions as well. And you can see by Saturday, it's the temperatures that'll take the top spot. And we're looking at them right now up in Canada. Look at that, 18 below in Old Crow, 37 below up in Cambridge Bay. It's not going to get that cold, but we are in for some negative temperatures as we head into the weekend. And the wind chills will definitely get your attention, too. All that coming up in a few minutes, Karen. All right, thank you, Ben. The FBI is investigating this afternoon an operation that turned violent and deadly in South Florida. Two FBI agents were shot to death, three others wounded after trying to serve a warrant in a suburb of Fort Lauderdale. The warrant was connected to a case involving child pornography and violent crimes against children. Gunfire erupted around 6 a.m. The entire neighborhood was locked down until the suspect was eventually killed as well. Later, there was this police procession as the slain officers' bodies were taken to the morgue. The shootout marked one of the bloodiest days in FBI history in South Florida. 
Well, we all knew President Joe Biden's first 100 days would feature some of the most critical issues facing our country. And that's exactly how things are turning out. From COVID-19 to immigration to impeachment. Kimberly Gill tracking all the top storylines right now for us. Hi, Kim. Hi, Karen. Good afternoon. In about an hour, President Biden will take more action on immigration. He'll sign one executive order to establish a task force to reunite children separated from their parents at the U.S.-Mexican border. Meanwhile, the president's cabinet continues to come together as Pete Buttigieg is confirmed as transportation secretary. He's the first openly gay person to hold a cabinet post. We're seeing dueling briefs in the looming impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump. House Democrats say Trump's responsibility for the January 6th Capitol attack is, quote, unmistakable. Trump's legal team, though, argues the Senate cannot try someone who isn't president anymore and any statements made by the president before the attack are protected by free speech. Finally, a two-hour White House meeting between President Biden and 10 Republicans did not end, did not lead, I should say, to a compromise on COVID relief. Democrats say they are ready to push a plan without any Republican support. So right now, President Biden's plan will cost about $1.9 trillion. The Republican plan is worth about $618 billion, one third of the president's proposal. Democrats hope to have a deal done sometime by March. We'll have another report carrying from, from Washington tonight on the news at five. Until then, we'll send it back to you. All right, thank you, Kim. Sure. Well, a potpourri of challenges connected to remote learning is starting to show through the cracks in the system all across the board. One wild card emerging in all of this, the impact of parents on test results and also spotting any possible lag in learning. Our Paula Tupman digs into those factors with some key players in local education. In school districts across the state, there's grave concern, particularly those in urban districts where poverty competes for the attention in many households. It's something Dr. Nikolai Viti of the Detroit Public Schools Community District is grappling with. Just how much learning loss has his students suffered? I don't think we're going to have a good indication of how much loss we've seen until students take the state assessment at the end of the year and then they're hopefully in, in back in school in greater numbers by the fall when they test in school. And earlier this week, it's something Pontiac School District Superintendent Kelly Williams disclosed. We saw um, a huge learning loss. I mean, little, literally two grades behind. Students aren't the only ones struggling with schoolwork from afar. Monica's son is a seventh grader in the Pontiac Public School District. It takes a lot to keep him on, on track, like he has to be diverted back on task uh, a lot, um, but that's been an ongoing issue. But in reading between the lines, what educators realize is they don't really know how far many of their students have fallen behind because of false flags. We're actually seeing an increase in performance, but that is um, an inflated increase because our early grade level performance is much higher than the previous year. And our instincts tell us that um, parents help their children at home. And it's not that parents are deliberately trying to mislead the grading system. They are simply struggling with watching their young children struggle in their own juggle to pull everything off they have to pull off in order to survive the COVID climate. So kindergarten, first, second, somewhat third grade, we're seeing a skewing of the data because I think parents are helping their students because they're struggling and they don't want to see them struggle. So they just you know, help them, you know, answer the question because most of the testing is happening at home because most of the students are learning online. Older students like high school students tend to be more self-reliant. And so where they are failing is actually easier to spot. We are seeing loss and that's defined by the PSAT and the SAT on the baseline assessment where we see more students that are much below uh, college readiness uh, scores than we've seen before. Yeah, you know, there's just so much to unpack here, but this learning loss is real for many, many students. And it really, Karen, it goes beyond this whole idea of pass-fail. It goes to making sure that students are appropriately and adequately ready to advance so that they can actually compete nationally and globally. And, and so this hill is a big hill to climb. The hill is a mountain. Yeah. Thank you, Paula. Yeah. Still ahead, first at four, she's become a political lightning rod. Now, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez makes one of her most personal revelations ever. Also, an icy rescue caught on camera. We're going to talk about this major operation and find one brighter moment in the middle of an East Coast pounding.
A first, remembering an international hero who did more after turning 100 than many people do in a lifetime. We'll be right back.